As they say in Israel, what up? You guys doing well? You're looking good this morning. Just got back from uh, Charlotte, and uh, we had an amazing uh, time with uh, Sid Roth last week. Uh, We landed on uh, Tuesday night, uh, and we started uh, filming on Wednesday with his team. Uh, Did a bunch of, uh, like, commercials and stuff, and um, as well as a web show. uh, As we were filming, there was, like, this ruckus that was happening, and um, they were sending a message from the control room into the studio, and the cameraman goes, hey, to me, was Daryl your dad? And I was like, yeah, 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 he, he was and is, you know, he passed away in 2016, but, you know, he's still, he's still around. And I said, yeah, yeah, he's my dad. And, uh, and he goes, they're, they're freaking out in the control room right now, and the reason why is because uh, the, the, their producers and a lot of their media people actually came or they were like the media team in Toronto during the 90s and uh and they were like apparently fans of my dad which by the way my dad doesn't have a lot of fans in the U.S. okay after after my parents went through divorces stuff, my dad kind of lost some of his popularity you know and um good times he was he was kind of a big deal in Indonesia and Russia and Ukraine but you just don't hear a lot of that in the U.S. So I thought, man, that's interesting. The next day, uh, we got to the studio, and they said, Sid wants to see you in his makeup room. And so um, I went into his room. They're getting him uh, ready. And he said, uh, Daryl Stott was your dad. And I said, yeah. And he said, um, he goes, I think very highly of your dad. And anyways, and he had some thoughts th- that, w- that were really interesting. And, and we had kind of like this moment that I wasn't really expecting that to have. And then he said to me, when I was a young man, <laughs> he, said, um, he said that Catherine Coleman said to him that it was her desire to host the glory with excellence through media. He said, and and then she moved to Hollywood where she started her own show and she began doing that. He said that Catherine Coleman prayed for him that he would receive that anointing to host the glory with excellence through media. And I thought, well, that's pretty cool, right? So at lunchtime, I was sitting across the table from him and hearing different stories and asking him questions. And then I said, "Um, Sid, would you be willing to pray for me that I would be able to receive that anointing to host the glory with excellence through media. And he said, only if you'll host a show for me on my network. And I was like, we, we, right? I was like, <laughs> and he said, at no cost, not even a penny. And so um, I was like, so let me get this straight. If I host a show for you at no cost, n- not even a penny on your network, you'll pray for me that I will receive that anointing that you received from Catherine Coleman to host the glory with excellence through media. Let me pray about that. want to release some short little teachings or if you got something you just want to see if there's a need for in the body like just send that off to us and we'll put that on our app and like just like and to me that was even cooler than the show i mean just to be able to have that kind of relationship where they're like like let's partner let's get your stuff out there you know um and and you know his thing is a big thing because you know uh, his network is available on every television set in israel yeah do you know that his network is available all throughout the Middle East? 
that there is not one evangelistic Christian TV show in Israel except for his, and they've left him alone to just, isn't that amazing? So on the outside, I was just like, oh, sweet, yeah, this is good. On the inside, the spirit of Darren was like, I got to dance. Ah! You know, I was like, I was, I was freaking out. Anyways. <laughs> it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. It's good. Yeah. All right, happy Father's Day. God bless all the fathers in this place, all the future fathers, okay, all, all the grandfathers, okay? God bless you. This is going to be a little bit different. Typically on Father's Day, you try to come up with ways to get dads to come to church, right? You, you know, you, have, you put fishing rods on the stage. You have a lot of, you know, j- jokes about stuff that dads laugh at. I don't know. Um, so anyways, if, if you're used to like a really good, like, Father's Day message to get you to come to church today, you know, it, this is going to be a little different because of today I'm actually speaking on um, the, the whole GLBTQ plus 38 or whatever. I don't know. Can't keep it. Change, the title changed. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about Pride Month and how we as the church should respond to this month, okay? So that's what we're talking about. And I actually think that that has a lot to do with fathers, I actually think that that has a lot to do with, um, with, with Father's Day. Yeah, yeah. So I, I do think that there's, there's a link there. But as you can tell, we went to no effort to try to get dads to show up today. Okay? And, um, and we're not sorry. Okay, here we go. <laughs> we went to a lot of effort to get Holy Spirit to show up. You know, it's like, it's like the thing, uh, you know, creating atmospheres to get people to show up. You know, l- l- you know. <laughs> versus let's create atmospheres where God shows up and shows off. Right? So... All right, so yeah, today we're going to be talking about this whole thing of the, this, uh, this agenda and what's, what's taking place. A um, few years back, um, it was my wife's birthday, Andrea. Her birthday was in June, and apparently uh, it'll be in June again this month. Um, her birthday falls on the same day every year. Um, she's got one of them birthdays, and you know... Me and numbers, okay, I'm not that impressed. In fact, the kids were making fun of me yesterday because I put one of my daughter's birthdays on the wrong date on the calendar, and they were all laughing at me, and they're like, anyways. So yes, I know what Andrea's birthday is, even though she asked me at the end of May, you know, when's my birthday, and I, and, you know, and I, and I tell her, and I always get right, don't ask me what it is. So a few years back, what she wanted was she wanted to go to a restaurant on one of the islands, okay, and she wanted to have a meal on the water, not too much to ask for. And what I really appreciated about that is that she told me what she wanted, which all the men will know if your wife actually tells you what she wants for her birthday. Um, that's a big deal because uh, most women believe that their husbands ought to just know what they want, okay? <laughs> right? I shouldn't have to tell you. You should just know. And, and every dude here is like, I have no clue, okay? <laughs> We're on... <laughs> We're on Amazon, like, you know, like, oh, God, you know. So anyways, that was easy that year, okay? And please pray for me this year. It's coming up. Not a clue. All right, here we go. All right, so. Now, so I find this restaurant, okay? Yeah, yeah, and we find an island. We catch a ferry. We go out on this island, and we go in this restaurant. And, um, and I'm a little slow, okay? Yeah. And we're at this restaurant, and to me, this is great. They got a good burger. That's all that matters to me. Like, a good burger. We're there. And, um, but I wasn't really catching the fact that, like, basically, we were eating in rainbow land, okay? And, um, and that the, the waiter that was helping us also lived in rainbow land. And it was, it was like, there was, man, there was, like, some stuff happening in that restaurant that wasn't, that wasn't a good thing. Again, I was kind of slow, and then when we left, Andrew was like, all I asked for was to go to a nice restaurant on the wall, you know, and you took me to, to, to Rainbow World, right? Like, like well, what, what in the heck? What, like, and, and, and the problem was that we were eat, trying to, you know, celebrate Andrea's birthday in a place where there was a very clear demonic agenda. Now, I will say that at that time, I didn't even know that that was a thing. I didn't even knew, know that June month was, was, this, was this celebration of, of, of rainbows and, and everything, right? 
now we all know, and what's interesting is that this June of 2022, it's, it's, it's different than it's ever been in the sense that, um, that this agenda is targeting children unapologetically. And, and let me just say that it is an agenda. Now, when, I, when I'm sharing with you today, as we're talking through this, you need to see that I'm not going to be attacking people or gays or lesbians or anything like that. Uh, I'm not actually going to be looking at that, really. What we're going to be looking at is actually the overarching militant agenda that is behind it. Because we don't really wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and, and strongholds, okay? So this is what we're actually going to be looking at. So I'm not attacking any person today, but I am kind of bringing a little bit of, of exposure to a, an agenda. And, um, and then we're going to talk about what our response is, because that's really important, okay? I'm not going to be telling you necessarily a, a lot of new information, but I think what will be helpful is well, we're all kind of trying to process through this month and then wondering how to process through it with our children, right? And then wondering, like, what is our response supposed to be and this year it, 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 it's it's really it's 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 not i mean you see even like pizza hut is driving this agenda of transgenderism and integration with children actually grooming children uh, even uh, for the very first time ever in june um disney released their very first feature where their hero would have a same-sex kiss with uh, you know so you have buzz lightyear right um kissing another man Okay, uh, uh, even just last night, uh, Marvel, Com- like I've always been a big Marvel guy, okay, um, some of you are DC people, so God will forgive you, but I, like, I've always been a big Marvel guy, and, um, and like Marvel released their thing on uh, Instagram last night, came up on my feed, of two superheroes making out, okay, and, and celebrating that, re- that reality, and the very first comment was the official Star Wars and I mean, I've always been a big Star Wars guy. Like, Star Wars, right? Come on. Yeah. Okay, whatever. And, and the very first comment that came up was the official blue check mark Star Wars. And they were, you know, um, celebrating this, this, this makeout session between uh, these two, you know, superheroes. And then, I mean, j- I mean, it's just like, it's just, it's in your face. And it's like, you, ha- you have to celebrate this, right? Because it's pride month, okay? And so um, we're going to look at this uh, today. Now, let me just say that what we are seeing is a very clear agenda. Um, We didn't just arrive here accidentally. This is a very methodical plan, okay, that's not actually that hard to find. There was a witch, okay, and yes, an actual witch, who lived back between 1880 and 1949. Her name was Alice Bailey. You can look this up. Alice Bailey was actually the founder of the New Age movement. She was a prolific author. She carved out what she called the 10 points, okay, this was her 10 points, her charter to subvert the authority of Christianity in America. Um, Her goal was to begin to um, extract any form of Christianity from the ethos of this country in order to bring our country into its spiritual new age, okay? Or into paganism. And here's what her 10 points were. And remember, this is late 1800s, okay? Number one, to take God and prayer out of the education system. Number two, reduce parental authority over children. Number three, destroy, and I'll read that verb again, destroy the Judeo-Christian family structure or the traditional Christian family structure. To make abortion legal and easy. Number five, to make divorce legal. Legal and easy. To free people from the concept of marriage for life. We even see this. There's a, you know, a massive movement, even with the uh, Generation X, where Generation Xers, when interviewed, would say that they are accepting this concept of serial marriage. That it takes being married to several partners before you can really find the right partner that you will be compatible with. Number six was to make homosexuality an acceptable alternative lifestyle. Number seven, 
to debase art and to make it run mad. Number eight, to use media to promote and to change mindsets. In fact, if you want to go deeper down this rabbit hole, you can go to, I did a whole, a whole session on this. Um, you can YouTube, Seattle Revival Center, Gender Theory, and I will take you slowly through published documentation of the plan to use media as the primary tool to reprogram our nation. And I, I share all these screen prints and everything. I mean, it's like, you know, I'm not making this up. You can find that there was a very clear plan that was ruled out uh, even in the 60s and 70s that we're seeing executed now. And not just executed, but celebrated. Wow, we are so tolerant, right? Yay, look at us. So open-minded. Okay, number nine, to create an interfaith movement. Okay, and then number 10, to get governments to make all of these laws and then to get the church to endorse to promote these changes 10 points all of which have been successfully executed this is not a plan that's someday going to get executed we are living in the reality of what was birthed through a person because people are portals and hell has no influence over humanity except for through people which means that you cannot bind the spirit of homosexuality over america why because it's not a cloud the enemy executes his authority through people This is not new to you. We've been in Eden. Lucifer had access to Eden. He did not have access to humanity unless he corrupted Adam and Eve. So you cannot bind something that is in the heavenlies if it's manifesting and germinating in the hearts of humanity. We wish that we could because then we could stay in our jammies and spend hours in church buildings thinking that we're changing the culture. Screaming at the raptors. Ha! Jesus didn't say to do that. Jesus said to go disciple nations, which means that there's no way to transform the world except by working and loving real messed up people. If we are not bringing ministry to the people, we are not changing the culture. It's the truth. It's the truth. You, we got to stop binding stuff up there if we're not loving people here. Jesus has to be the model, not the last hundred years of charismatic prayer. We have to start to, we got to learn to love discipleship, not just listening to ourselves. I wish somebody would say amen. Thank you. <laughs> I asked for it. All right, you guys are so awesome. All right, so hell has an agenda bad news. Heaven has an agenda. Good news. I'm here because I got good news. I'm not here because I'm bummed out. I am here because Jesus is alive and I got Holy Spirit all up in me. Okay? I'm not intimidated by the spirit of the world. Why? Because greater is he who is in me. I've seen people set free. I've seen demons come out of people. I've seen people change. I've seen some of the most messed up people get restored. And I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about me. Listen, if he can change me, he can change anybody. Yeah, no, I'm serious. I'm not going to go bragging about my wickedness. But God, if he, could, if he can work with me, he, trust me, yo, he can work with you. So it is so radically important that we know that hell has an agenda and it is being executed by people. But heaven has an agenda and it's being executed by people. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. You know, when it comes, when it comes to, these, when it comes to these, these factors and when it comes to these, these different things, it's important that we recognize that these, 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 these places are not always demons. When we talk about strongholds, you can't cast out a stronghold. Why? Because a stronghold is a fortress of thought. What we're wrestling with this, this, this month in June it's, it's a problem. 
But the problem is not a demon. Darn. Why? Because if the problem was a demon, man, we could cast it out. And the problem is something. I'm just, I'm really dragging this on. I know the suspense is, is, is like, ah, it's so much suspense. The problem has nothing to do with gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual, cis, cis, I I don't even, like I said, there's 70 classifications. Even though in Genesis, Moses said that God created man and woman, and now there's 70 different classifications. You know, and if you're gender fluid, you can change your gender at will. You know, one, one girl she was interviewed, she says she changes her gender up to 16 times a day. Yeah. Sid Roth just told the story, I don't know if you saw it, but he told the story about his, his, uh, his grandchild that, that came home from school and asked, and asked his mom if, if he was a boy or a girl. She said, why would you ask that thing? She said, because my teacher asked me that question. Kindergarten. The problem is not a demon. The problem is a stronghold, but it opens up the door to demons, all kinds of demons. And the stronghold is prevalent in the church of Jesus Christ. And the stronghold is pride. This month, we are celebrating pride as a country. What's the problem with that? Pride comes before a... Pride comes before a fall. And what we know is that pride has everything to do with the exaltation and the celebration of self outside and apart from Jesus Christ. Pride, you can be religious and have pride. We see that all the time when Jesus was talking to people. These people that thought they were amazing because of who they were. These people who thought that they were going to heaven because of what they had done. Or that they weren't going to hell because of things that they hadn't done. We see that, you know, the Lord actually addresses pride. Uh, We see in uh, James chapter 4, verse 6. You can write it down if you want. James chapter 4, verse 6. That God opposes the proud. So pride comes before a fall and God opposes the proud. You know, people say, God will accept everybody. God will accept everyone. He will never reject anyone because God is love. The problem with that is the Bible. So if you say, this is my month, To be proud. This is who I am. If you don't like it, you're the problem. Not me. Celebrate me. Why? Because I'm worthy to be this. Ah, Or if you're here and you say, at least I ain't one of them gays. At least I ain't one of them homosexuals. I was so done with them gays. Thank God I'm not one of them. Well, who are you then? Straight people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. If you're struggling with gender confusion and all that, what do you need? Jesus. If you're straight, what do you need? God knows you need Jesus too. Is there anybody here in this room that could say, thank God I don't have any sexual brokenness in my family line. Everybody in my family line did everything according to God's perfect moral code. You and I, we were born into the generational fracturedness of unwise choices made by our ancestors. And if we're honest, we made our own unwise choices as well. And nobody here can have pride in who you are aside from Jesus the Christ. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll tell you, when you find yourself worshiping Jesus, and then you look at the person on your right and your left, you don't find yourself any better than them. When we find ourselves loving Jesus and worshiping Jesus, we find we're all the same moral height. Right, because when we worship Jesus, we find ourselves on our knees, and when we get on our knees and acknowledge who he is and how badly we need him, it has a way of humbling our hearts. When you find yourself loving Jesus, worshiping Jesus, and you see yourself for who you are with him, and you know who you are without him, it only reminds us of our great, great need for a great, great Savior. Thank Jesus for Jesus. Amen? So with great confusion being released into our schools, into our homes, through cell phones and iPads, I mean, uh, 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 Disney Plus, you'll see a big banner there trying to get your kids to click on it. Celebrate Pride Month, right? Uh, if you're on any sort of Netflix, I mean, it doesn't matter where you go. And um, it's not going to get better anytime soon. Darkness is going to get more and more dark. The promise is that in times like these, there will be a remnant. There will be a people who are not friends with the darkness. A people who have not shared their hearts with compromise. There will be a generation that begins to arise and shine, and the glory of the Lord will shine up and through them. And this is what I know about darkness. When I go into dark environments, I pop. When you go into dark environments, you contrast greatly. Why? Because of the hope of glory who is residing inside of you. So here's what's going on right now. You have a very, I'll tell you this too real quick, um, on the documentation uh, for this carving out of an agenda in the 60s and 70s, this is what was stated. Our ability to assimilate this philosophy into the American construct, and this is my own words, okay, um, is very presumptuous. Our ability to execute this um, is almost impossible. But we will approach this with great urgency and militancy, and we will do everything possible to change the American culture. What if the church of Jesus Christ could get some blueprints from heaven? And what if we could say our ability to actually transform and redeem the culture is somewhat impossible? But with great last day's urgency, we will partner together to seek heaven, to get his blueprints for us corporately and our scrolls for us individually so that we will do everything possible to partner together to glorify God by seeing his father heart established in our generation and in our nation. Will we be successful? Probably not. It's very naive to think that we could actually disciple nations. But it's actually what Jesus has asked us to do. And the only way we're going to be able to do this is to make a great commitment. And what's the great commitment to? You know, our, our, our country used to be somewhat of a Christian nation. Christianity was the primary ethos within everything that formed out our constitution to really being the, the primary theology be, behind our founding fathers. And, and there is a lot of jacked up stuff. I get it, right? Absolutely. Um, and yet, when you look at it, this was, this was kind of the, 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 the great deal. Now, Pastor Darren, it, when you say disciple nations and to see great restoration come to our country, are you talking about us going back to the way that things were? No. When God restores something, he never hits the rewind button. When God restores something, he hits the fast forward button. There will come a time when all things are restored. 
He will restore all things. So when somebody's blind eyes open, did he take them back to his original plan? Or did he take them to the future and the restoration of all things? And did he pull the future into the present? God doesn't want to take you back to the in, your innocence of being 12 years old. No, no, no. He wants to take you forward to the restoration of all things and pull that. So no, we are not trying to Christianize America. We kind of had that day. What are we trying to do? We're trying to kingdomize it. Our prayer is that it wouldn't be on earth as it is at church. <laughs> that's not the goal. Pray this way. On earth as it is at SRC. Okay, that, that's not, all right, okay. That wouldn't be all that bad. But no, he said pray this way. On earth as it is in heaven. Jesus said, pray, let your kingdom come. No, we're not trying to make the USA some big church service. What we want to see is his heavenly shalom. We want to see every person functioning according to God's original blueprint and biology. We want to see every person functioning without any record of shame, without any man-made religious limitations. We want to see what would be possible if humanity could flourish underneath the banner of the Father's love, without fear, without shame, without control. What would the earth be like if people knew that they were loved by a kind father and didn't have to be afraid of eternal punishment? What would people respond if they knew that it's not that their sins need to be forgiven or that they need to do something to become better, but that on the cross, Jesus died for the sins of humanity. He said, it is finished. How would you respond if you found out you're not an orphan, you were lied to, you're a son and a daughter of the Most High God? The only reason why you're conscious is because the Spirit of Christ Jesus, that the Spirit, that you've got a Spirit in you, it's the God breath that's been loaned to you, it's the Ruach of God, that even the staunch atheist can say, I don't believe in any of that God stuff, but he's got a Spirit being that Solomon would say has been embedded with the record of eternity eternity so even Richard Dawkins himself says you have to be a fool to believe in God you probably also believe in the Easter bunny but he's got a spirit inside of him that says I know there's a God I know there's more I want this eternity I want understanding but because I don't have understanding I will take pride in my humanity I will glory in my carnality I will say this is who I am deal with it and if you you don't deal with it the problem is yours not mine what would seattle be like if every person in seattle knew that they were infinitely loved and accepted and that the provision for all of their sins had been paid for in blood that there has been a great atonement what would seattle look like if people knew they don't have to hide from a father who is calling them by name coming to walk with them, what would Seattle look like if there was no nakedness, if there was no shame? This is the gospel. This is the good news of Jesus Christ that no, you do not have to live life on earth underneath this curse of being damned. You are a son of righteousness, therefore live righteously. You are loved Therefore, obey and respond with worship and adoration. You are a child of the king. For God so loved the elect. Wrong. For God so loved the righteous. Wrong. Jesus said, I did not come for those who think they have already been saved. I came for those who are lost, jacked up, messed up. And I came to tell them this. I love you. I am here for you. All your stuff. I'm about to die for it. I'm about to make access possible through my blood, through my life. Salvation is about Jesus. It's not about you. Salvation is the Lord's, as Jonah would say. SRC, we are going to disciple people with spiritual amnesia who do not know where they have come from, who do not know where they are going, and we are going to disciple them into the consciousness that is this place where they know that they are sons and daughters of the Most 
high God. This place where it says that Paul was ministering to the woman, uh, the businesswoman, Lydia, uh, from Thyatira, who would work with purple goods. And it says that at a certain moment, she got it. And in the Greek, it's this word that means like an epiphany. It's, it's this word that means an aha moment. And I am telling you, what I am contending for is that we will see many Lydia's step into, <laughs> into these moments where, where they just get it. They step into these epiphany moments where the quarter drops. And it just makes sense. The Holy Spirit will do the work if we are willing to partner with this good news. With this glorious good news. Because I'll tell you what's going on. These, these, these people that are, that are trying to drive an agenda, there is this narrative that the church of Jesus Christ hates them. That they are the enemy. That we just want to shame them. That they don't have a place here. I see a lot of empty seats here. And these empty seats would be great for people who are wrestling with same-sex attraction. Why? Because we can say, look, we get the whole sexual brokenness thing. We are here because of the grace of God. Therefore, there's no better place for you to be than right here with us because we know what it, what it means to be jacked up. We know what it means to be hurt. We know what it means to be abused. We know what it means to be betrayed. You, you're, not, you're not alone in this. And if Jesus can change me, he can change you. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and stuff, you know. And at the end of the day, you know, the Israelites, how long did it take for them to get freedom? Yeah, it took a while. And yet, you know what? It was almost like their freedom wasn't God's ultimate goal. The whole time, they're just trying to get to the promised land. The whole time, they're just trying to stop swearing as much. The whole time, they're just trying to stop getting high as much. The whole time, they're they're just trying to get to the outcome. But you know that entire time, you know what he was looking for? Relationship intimacy he's like are you just after the land or could we actually have a thing you my friend are not my project and either is the glbtq plus 38 people are not projects these are sons and daughters who the father wants relationship with And if they can come into relationship with the Father, His kindness will do the the rest. His kindness will do the rest. So if pride's the problem, and if pride's in the church, what's the answer? That's a good question. What's the answer? If God opposes the proud but he embraces the humble, then what should our response be? What's the answer? How do we shift things? How do we change things? I forgot to give this, um, this Bible verse at the 9 a.m. So that the poor 9 a.m., they are out, they're going to be doing life this week, feeling incomplete. They're just going to know something's off. They're like, that was a good sermon, but man, something's, what, what happened? It's because Pastor Darren forgot to give them the last, this last verse. So, praise the Lord, you're not going to feel incomplete. It's because you guys are my favorite service. I, I tell all the services. All right, so Second, second, second Chronicles. So you guys know Second Chronicles. If you've been saved longer than 20 minutes, you know Second Chronicles 7.14. This, this comes up all the... You can get on Facebook right now. Somebody's going to be putting this on Facebook right now. If my people... <laughs> if my people who are called by my name, will pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land, right? So that's what, that's what, we, that's what we hear. That's, and, and, and all the time we say, if my people, okay, was called by my name, would just begin to pray. Guys, that's the problem with America. That's the problem with the church. We're not praying enough. Right? So then what do we do? We, got, we schedule more prayer meetings, right? Well, we already, at SRC, we already have a prayer meeting every day of the week. 
that's not enough, right? So we need prayer meetings in the mornings. In the evening. Why? Because the verse, Pastor Masu, the verse says right here, if my people will pray, or call my way, pray. Can I tell you what's missing? The text doesn't say that. The text says this, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. Why? If you're going to have a conversation, you want to get the dude on the phone first. How do you get somebody on the phone first? How do we get God on the phone first? If we're going to pray, that's great. But don't bother praying unless we can first humble ourselves. In times of crisis, in times of urgency, what do we need? Humility. I'll tell you a quick story. During the, during the Civil War, okay, uh, there was a general. His name was General Hooker, okay? I would have paid to get my name changed, but his name was General Hooker. Listen, this guy was, 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 was really cocky. He was really arrogant. Why? Because he had General Lee surrounded. And not only surrounded, General Hooker had a two-to-one army against General Lee. His, his, his army was twice as large as General Lee. And he, had, he, he broke his army up into thirds. And he maneuvered them. He had them surrounded. This is what he knew. He knew that as soon as General Lee found out that he was outnumbered and surrounded, that he was going to surrender. In fact, General Hooker said this. He said, God Almighty himself could not save General Lee. Look at this amazing ship. God himself could not sink this ship. What's the name of it? The Titanic. Where's the Titanic today? At the bottom of the ocean. So, General Lee found out we are surrounded and outnumbered. And what did General Lee do? He began to fight. And he fought and he fought and he fought. The problem was this. General Hooker's army was so full of pride, victory was so inevitable that they were partying. Drinking, getting drunk, not vigilant, not paying attention. And when they least expected it, in their pride, General Lee and his outnumbered army, they didn't just win that battle. This particular battle is referred to as the biggest, most humiliating butt-kicking in the entire Civil War. And General Lee was seen as a disgrace. In times of conflict, in times of adversity, in times of war, we don't just need men and fathers that have the right answer and know exactly what to do. They've got the certainty. Follow me. I've got the answer. We don't need anybody. We've got this. That's what humanity always wants. Humanity always wants leaders that have certainty. This is what we're going to do. I know exactly where we're at. Follow me. Ha! That's what we want. That's what, that's what saves the day. But in times like these, we need leaders who have one thing. Humility. We might not have all the answers, but we're willing to listen. We might not know what to do right now, but we're willing to pray. Leaders that say, I know for sure one thing. I cannot do this by myself. I'm going to need to surround myself with, with, with men and women that I can trust, that I'm ready to advance with. Churches that are humble, that know that not one single church is going to change the world. It's going to happen through the bride of Christ, a united company of churches that love God and love people. It's going to take, in times like these, we need leaders who are not arrogant, but are humble, who are real, who are accountable, who are transparent, that say, we don't have certainty, but we have clarity. We have Jesus. We have each other. 
And if we seek him, we will be found by him. If we knock, we know the door will be open. Let's stand. In the 9 a.m., I prayed that Buzz Lightyear would repent. <laughs> we won't pray that way in this, in this service. But just to let you know, we pray that way. So if it happens, it's because of me. All right. I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. Put out your hands, just a receiving posture. I just want to bless every person in this room. I want to bless you and your significance. I want to bless you and your identity right now. You are not an accident. You were formed and fashioned and framed by God for such a time as this. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this house of leaders, this house of servants who have humble hearts, who have made themselves available for your plan for your purpose. Lord, we repent for partnering with the spirit of pride. We repent for thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to. We repent for not having grace for those who needed kindness, for those who needed a friend. Father, we repent for inserting our own agendas before seeking you for your heavenly agenda. And Lord, we say we make ourselves available. We come knocking at your door this morning. We say we don't, we don't, we don't have a 10 point plan to redeem Seattle, but we do have you, King Jesus. We know that you are the king of nations. We know that you are the king of cities. We know that you are in love with us and you are in love with with our city. Lord, we make ourselves available. We make Seattle Revival Center available. And we ask that the kindness of God would be seen and experienced because of these people, because of these hands. Father, we ask, Lord, that those who don't think that there's any hope, we ask for those who are, who are suicidal. I think of the story right now of the lady that was driving around uh, these streets looking for a place to kill herself when she saw that we were having a church service and she drove up into the parking lot. She came into the meeting and Charlie called her out and, and gave her a word and Jesus came to her in a vision and, 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 and rescued her in the vision. She came out of the trance and said, Jesus came to me. Jesus rescued me. Father, I pray, Lord, for many, many stories like that, that you would use us, you would use Seattle Revival Center to bring revival and restoration to this great city of Seattle. Let there be justice. Let there be deliverance. Let there be revelation. Lord, let there be a foundation of the Father's love. I thank you, Lord for the seeds of the gospel that were planted in our soil by Chief Seattle. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for his generosity, for his understanding of the good news of Jesus. Father, we know that story, how him and his family were ripped off. Lord, we know that story of, of, of Doc Maynard and the brothels and the, and, and the, and the corruption that came into, into Seattle. And Lord, we pray that the prayers of Chief Seattle, that Seattle would be known for her generosity. Lord, that, these, that his prayers would be restored. And Father, we ask, Lord, that the transgressions committed by Doc Maynard and those who came in to, to corrupt the prayers and to corrupt the innocent of what you had established. Lord, that your kingdom plan for Seattle would be established and not through just the mayor or political system, but we ask, oh God, for the righteous, Lord, to begin to arise in the city, that the righteous, the sound of the righteous, the sound of the Sadek, Lord, that the order of Melchizedek, the order of the kings and priests would begin to arise in this hour. And I bless every king and queen in this room. I bless those in finance and business. Lord, I bless those who are in the trenches in the cities. I bless, Lord, Lord, those who, who you have established, I bless them, and I pray that they would see their significance in the kingdom, that the kings would, would take a hold of this time, and that they would use who they are to bring restoration to this region. I bless the priests that are here in this room. 
I bless those middlemen, those intercessors. I bless those who you have called to anoint people, to stand in the gap. Lord, I bless the priests that are in this room. This is a house of kings and priests, anointed ones. And God, I pray for fresh oil to be released in this room, for fresh oil to be released in this room, fresh oil for a fresh assignment, fresh oil for a fresh assignment. Yeah.